Hi, Casey. My name is Tim Hogan-Bowman. I'm one of the pastors on staff here and um, been here for the last couple of years. I'm a COVID baby in terms of ministry. And so usually I hang out in the offices, but uh, this is such a privilege to be able to come and, and to wrap up our series on the good and beautiful life and to talk about self-control. And self-control is one of those things that we all struggle with. You and I struggle with. I would reckon to say that if we took a moment and, and look back at some of our biggest regrets in life, my guess is that has to be tied to a lack of self-control. And all of us struggle through this. All of us wrestle through this. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at Jesus in the desert and his self-control and what we can glean from that. So why don't you turn to me to Luke, uh, to Luke 4. In the 70s, um, there was this experiment and this experiment was called the marshmallow experiment. Some of you may have known of this. And in this experiment, what scientists did was they took a bunch of kids and they sat them individually in a room and they put a table in front of them and then put a marshmallow or pretzel in front of them. And what they said was, um, you can have it. You can have this pretzel or marshmallow, but if you have self-control, if you hold back, if you wait then you get more down the road, but you have to wait. And so then the scientists exit out of the room and the cameras turn on. And now comes the fun part. Some kids sat there and just had no self-control, no sense of, uh, of restraint and just ate, right? Just ate the marshmallow or ate the pretzel. Other kids would, would grab it and, and want to eat it, but then put it back down again. And, and, and you could see this wrestle in this struggle because the delayed gratification w wasn't computing. And so they were trying to wrestle through it. Other kids just did something altogether different. They looked around or they distracted themselves from the marshmallow. Other kids just flat out went to sleep and put their heads down and forget about the whole matter altogether, right? And what they found was that those kids who, who generally would distract themselves or move themselves from the temptation generally were able to do a lot better in managing self-control and having delayed gratification. Fascinating experiment. 20 years later, these same scientists follow back and they wanted to see how these same kids did in life later on. And interesting what they found was those kids who at the age of four and five and six had self-control, had restraint, had the ability to have delayed gratification, those very kids typically had better jobs, were better financially set up, lived healthier lives, had lower body mass index. Generally speaking, these kids had lower issues with drug and alcohol abuse. And overall, were generally happy. Happier than those who didn't. You see, the self-control that we face, we face from a very young age, and it has very real consequences as we look forward. This is a very real struggle that everybody in this room deals with, right? Whether it's a, a momentary time of discernment where you don't make a wise decision, where you, sh where you know you shouldn't have done that one thing, and it absolutely destroyed your marriage, or absolutely, absolutely robbed your bank account, or destroyed that relationship. All of us in this room can reflect back. And this is a struggle that all of us have faced and we've been wrestling with from the great thinkers. Even the, even the Apostle Paul himself, back in, in Romans says, I do the things I don't wanna do and I don't do the things I do wanna do. Right? This is something that we have, where is, none of us can escape from this challenge. And in fact, if we go back to Genesis, where God creates the garden, there is Adam and Eve are in this garden, there's no need that they have. They are in perfect harmony with each other and, and with God and with creation. It is the perfect, serene environment. There's nothing lacking in this environment. And it is in this environment, what happens? God puts a tree there and says, you can, you can enjoy everything here, but don't touch this tree. Don't eat of this fruit. Even in this perfect, serene environment, Adam and Eve completely fumble the ball. They completely stumble. This is something that you and I face continually. You know, I, I shouldn't have eaten that extra chocolate bar or I shouldn't have slept in that bed last night. I want to pack 
what it means to have self-control. And like I said, just kind of kind of do an overview of Jesus in the desert and then what we can glean from that. Because even the Apostle Paul struggled with this. But there's hope. So as we look at self-control, I want to point something out here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now it's interesting this one's at the end. It's in the end because it's different than the other ones. You see, when you have the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness, these are things that we want to wholeheartedly pursue. These are things that we want to actively engage. These are things we want to reach out for. Self-control, on the other hand, is the opposite because it's actually the need to restrain ourselves, the need to withhold, the need to hold back rather than pursuing love and joy and peace and patience wholeheartedly. In this case, we're actually holding something back. Self-control is unique and it almost encapsulates, almost creates a basket around the other ones, right? It's the under, underpinning on the other ones. You see, we're, we're made in the image of God. If we, if we look at uh, the Genesis narrative again. So as we look at Genesis 1 and God takes, you know, four or five days to create all of creation, right? We're talking about animals and trees and the, the stars in the sky and the heavens and then the fish in the sea and the plants. He creates everything. In the morning of the sixth day, he creates all mammalia. And, and, and it is at the end of that day that something really interesting happens. It's at the end of the day that he comes down and says, let us make man in our image. A very clear distinction. So what does he do? He takes the clay and he forms humankind. And when he forms humankind, he breathes his spirit into them. And it is at that moment that there's a delineation between mankind and the rest of creation. It's at that moment where you and I are differentiated from the animal kingdom. Let me explain. So we live in a, a, a hobby farm just north of town and we have sheep and cows and baby cows and kittens and we have chickens and turkeys. I mean, there's a bunch of things happening in our farm. Now, if I look at my cat, uh, my cat just does its thing, which means that my cat will, you know, chase after feathers. Uh, my cat will chase after mice. Uh, it will eat the mice um, minus the head. And, and then it will lay the head in front of our door as a gift to us, which we're grateful for because we know, you know, it's taking care of the mice. And then it'll go lick its behind and then it'll want to come and lick me, right? This is my cat. That's absolutely disgusting. But you know what? My rat cat doesn't do wrong. It just does. My animals don't do right or wrong. They just do. Now, they can do wrong in such a way that I don't want her to lick my face. That is true. But it's not doing it for any other reason that it wants to appease its master, it wants to be fed, and it, and it wants to be safe. The animal kingdom does what it does because that's what it does. Now, if I were to look at my kids, my expectation of my kids at the farm is that they don't do the same thing. Why? Because I have an expectation that my kids become more than themselves. They are more, they are, they have the ability to become above what they are, to confront themselves, to overcome themselves, and to become beyond themselves. It is not acceptable for my kids to act like my animals. They're completely distinct. In the same way that you and I have the ability to become more than ourselves and to make wise choices. We are called to be different. The Spirit of God is indwelled in us and it, it forces us to become more and different and clearly di differentiate ourselves from the kingdom. And yet it's a struggle for us to do that. And so I want to point us to Jesus because just like in the garden where the animal kingdom was created, and we, we were then created and the tree was put there. In that perfect circumstance, we couldn't resist delayed gratification or embrace delay, delayed gratification. Rather, we succumbed to and we were, fell victim to our self, lack of self-control. And so the question is, where, what does it look like to have self-control? And I want to point us to Jesus in Luke 4. Now, um, I want to preface this with... Um, with first, with uh, first John two sixteen, and why is that? 
So if I go to 1 John 2.16, we talk about here this idea of the, the temptations that you and I are all facing. 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, it is not from the Father, but it is from this world. We have the lust of the flesh, the lust, sorry, we have the lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the three things that we have struggled with all through the beginning of time. These are the three things that all the way from Adam and onward, we have struggled with. It is just, there's no new tricks in the book. Right? These are the things that we wrestle with. When we look at self-control, it is controlling these very things that we work at. And in some, in a lot of cases, fail. And it's the same for Jesus as we look at Luke 4. So, let me set the stage for you. So we have Luke 4, and, and this is, uh, John the Baptist is in the river, and he's baptizing, and with this baptism, Jesus comes along, and there's a little bit of a rebuttal. Jesus says, baptize me. G- uh, John says, I'm not worthy. Finally, Jesus gets baptized. So Jesus gets baptized, and he comes back up, and everyone's ch- clapping and cheering. It's exciting. You know, Ben's there taking the video because he wants to grab footage of it. We're going to use it later. This is, this is an exciting moment as Jesus gets baptized. And, and uh, the father comes down and says, you know, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and so this is affirming the relationship between the son and the father. The spirit comes down. I mean, this is, this is a glorious moment, right? And everyone's clear, cheering and clapping and they'll say, hey, let, let's go back to town. Let's go grab something to eat. Let's celebrate this. So, and so they all go back to town. And meanwhile, Jesus stands up and it says in Mark that he immediately went to the desert and he gets up and he starts walking into the desert and everyone's going, let's celebrate. And here's Jesus and he just walks into the desert. And here he goes in the desert for 40 days. For 40 days, he's in the desert without food and water. Now, I looked this up, and Google tells me that uh, you actually can't live on, you, you can't live without bread and water for more than 21 days. You have, you have a 21-day span. Now, I could be wrong. My son James could probably correct me on this, but let's just go with it. Let's just say that 21 days is kind of the, the, the frame, you know, the, the longest you can go without dying. Jesus is in there for 40 days. And he's at his, at his weakest point. And we know he's weak because the angels come and, and tend to him after this point. So it's, it's in this space that kind of sets up the framework of, of what's happening in this. And it's at this point that Satan comes at him and tempts him with the same three things that he tempts us all with all the time. Right? So the first temptation Satan comes with is the lust of the, uh, lust of the flesh. And what he says to Jesus is, if you're the son of God, you can take this bread, or so you take this rock and turn it into bread, which is true. He absolutely can. And we know this because if you look at, you know, later on, he turns the water into wine and among all the other miracles. So we know that's a true. And it almost makes sense because Jesus in his fleshly body is so worn and so weak and so tired after this length. He's got nothing left. And yet he has a mission to fulfill. So he could almost argue going, you know what? I've done my thing and, and I'm hungry. I need to survive because I need to accomplish the mission of dying on the cross. So it it would seem reasonable in some ways to say, yes, I am going to turn that rock into bread. But here's Jesus' rebuttal. This is so good. After I get to my passage. Here's Jesus' rebuttal. So good. Here's, he says, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, what he's doing here, he's actually referencing Deuteronomy 8. And in Deuteronomy 8, it, 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 it is talking about the Israelites being in the desert. As you can remember, the Israelites were in the desert. They had no food. They were hungry. And God says, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he gives them manna. See, what Jesus is acknowledging in this moment is, yes, I'm hungry and I'm near death. But you know what? God, it is he who sustains me. It is he who provides for me. And he's able to to cast that off. You know, when we're talking lust of the flesh, these are the things of, of the carnal nature. You know, your, your inability to stop eating, your comfort food, your chocolate at eight o'clock at night, 
or, or, or your, your addiction to uh, your bodily addictions or the, the porn you're addicted to or whatever. This is your body, you're craving your fleshly desires, wanting to burst forth and you taming it. This is Jesus coming down and taming his body and saying, I, provi- or I will depend on the provision of God. Great, awesome. Satan leaves him, carries on. The next time Satan comes to him is the lust of the eyes. And in the lust of the eyes, Satan takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you would only bow to me, if you would bow to me for a fraction of the second. You see, it wasn't a long bow. When he says, if you bow to me, it wasn't like an eternal bow. It was was a momentary choice. If you just momentarily bow to me, what you've come here to do, I can make it happen. Why? Because I'll give you the kingdoms of the world and then you can save them. Makes sense, right? It makes sense. What is Jesus saying? It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, referencing Deuteronomy 6, saying, you know what, it is in God that I trust. Yes, it may make sense to do that, but I believe and I, I trust in God and his provision and what he directs. Right, this, uh, this idea that I, I, I'm en- I <laughs> the envying of someone else, right? If you're on Instagram, this is to, to those who are on Instagram or Pinterest, going through, going, I wish, I wish, I wish, right? Or, or this, is, this is the car that drives by going, I wish I had that car. The external desire, and yet Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Okay, so, defeated, Satan goes away. Now Satan comes back a third time and talks about the pride of life. Now he takes Jesus to the mountaintop, sorry, to the mountaintop, to the top of the temple. And in the top of the temple, he says, you know what? In Psalm 91, it says, if you jump, that he will make sure that your your feet, the angels protect you so your feet don't hit a rock. Which is true, it does say that. But it's a perverse use of scripture. Because by trusting, by testing God, you're not trusting in him. There's no need for showmanship. And that's what he's trying to get at. And what does Jesus say? It is said, you shall not put the glory of God to the test. It's interesting, in the first temptation, Satan comes out, Jesus at his weakest point. His fleshly body is dying. And Jesus resists. But it's at that third one, we actually come to Jesus' strength, his knowledge of scripture. You see, when he can't get us at his weakest point, he'll try and get us at our strongest point. And one commentator calls it a little bit of a jiu-jitsu move, right? Comes up behind him, and the arrogance and the pride is what would undo him. You see, this, this battle, this scenario, this, this whole event in the desert is actually, is actually of cosmic proportions, as my friend would say. This is of cosmic proportions where it, eternity hangs on the balance, The pressure of of, on the weight on Jesus is so severe, is so much so. And if he fails, if he has just a momentary moment of inflection where he does make a wrong decision, the implications are eternal. How many how many of us have made a 40-second moment of indiscretion and destroyed 40 years of ministry or work or families? a 40 second moment of indiscretion, a 40 years of damage. It only took, all Satan asked for was a momentary bow and the entire weight of the world on him. And it's in that moment where we couldn't. Why couldn't we? Because we look at the back of the Eden, we had no pressure. We had a perfect life. We were perfectly situated to be there and the tree of life was there. There was no need for us. And yet we couldn't do it. And Jesus has all this weight of cosmic proportions weighing on him, on the balance. And in that moment, he stands. You see, where he, where we could not, he did. And what he did, we could not. And so I want to, I want to take a moment and kind of glean into what it is that we can learn from Jesus. So first off, we learn that he was in the fullness of the spirit. 
He was baptized and he was led by the Spirit. We can't have Galatians 23. That's all the fruits of the Spirit. We cannot have Galatians 23, or 5.23 rather, without first having John 15. Now, let's walk through here. What's John 15 say? It's a good question. We're good. Okay. So, remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. What fruit is that? Fruit of the Spirit. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit, fruit of the Spirit, unless you remain in me. I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This word remain is the word meno. It means to reside, to stay, to abide. Basically, we're talking about a verb here. Right? We're talking about this intentional act of staying and residing in Jesus. This idea of abiding in the vine, of being attached to the vine. You see, the, the fruit of the work of the Spirit is a byproduct of being attached to the vine. Without being attached to the vine, it's a forgery. Let me explain. So I was on the board uh, of what's called a secondary stage housing. Now, secondary stage housing is where, um, where we set up a, a house where people coming out of first stage housing can transition. Now, first stage housing is where you would go to uh, if you were in, dealing with alcohol or substance abuse. Uh, this is a place where we isolate or insulate you from the rest of the world. We create new patterns and new behaviors right over time. That's, that's a foreshadow, by the way, for what's coming. So we create, we create the space and then you develop new patterns and behaviors, but then we need to integrate you back or you need to integrate back into the real world and get a job, get new social uh, circles, get new life so that you can, you can maintain your sobriety or whatever it is that you're dealing with. I was on the board of this house, uh, of this secondary stage housing. And part of the secondary stage housing process was a 12-step progress that program that many are familiar with. And, and this program was developed back in the 1900s by a gentleman by the name of Frank Buckman. And he was a pastor. And part of this process was... Um, in the first stage of this process, was to say, look, I need help. It was humility. I cannot do this on my own. The second stage, or the second part of this process, is I need God. It's a very effective program. It's worked for years. But my experience was, as I sat on this board, I didn't see this house being as effective as I, knew, as I, was, I was thinking it could be. Until I realized something that happened. You see, over the, over the period of 100 years from 1900 to where we are today, right, over, the, over that period, um, it had actually, the, the wording had shifted from uh, we need uh, the help of God to we need the help of a higher power. And that higher power can be you. Consequently, it was less effective. You see, when you decouple from the vine, when you, when you bring it away from its root source, it still maintains, it still exists, but it becomes less and less effective. You know, if I have a pear tree and I pull a branch off of there, it still produces, there is still fruit on there. But over time, what happens? Over time, it starts to shift and mold and be compressed by the outside environment and it becomes less and less effective, less and less potent, and eventually rot and die. And this is, this is true for so many Christian institutions, right? Whether it is, whether it's hospitals or whether it's the institution of marriage, right? If you look back at the, the Christian history, the church of Jesus Christ has done so much good in our society and so many things we can attribute to the work of God through his church. However, when you decouple those things from the source, over time, they'll become less and less and less potent as they conform and shape and adjust and mold to the environment around them. One person said it this way, you're running off the fumes of your godly ancestors. Isn't that great? You're running off the fumes of your godly ancestors. When you remove it from the source, you're gonna run out of fuel 
as you run off the fumes. Without spirit, you have legalism. And it's merely behavior modification. Alan Noble, in his book, um, it, fantastic read, um, uh, Know Who You Are, or the book is Know Who You Are, um, says it this way. Christian ethics can be treated like a lifestyle option. You enjoy a sense of stability they provide and benefit socially, right? You, you, there, is, there is a benefit to taking on the Christian institutions. When you choose to follow God's law out of personal preference, so when you choose to follow God's law because you want to benefit the how without the why, you will eventually discover a breaking point. When your desire for experiences or self-expression comes against the ethical law. When you simply want the byproduct without the source, there's gonna come a time where you're gonna hit a breaking point. Because you need to be tied to the source because it's what changes your heart. It's what changes you on the inside. If we're talking about self-discipline and changing rhythms and patterns of behaviors, there are far smarter people out there who could help you with that. There are people out there who are way more educated in this and way more, uh, have way better understanding of how to navigate self-control. If, I, if you remove Jesus from it, they're way better of it. But my argument here is, is it starts at the heart. It starts by being abiding to the vine and are tied to the vine. And once you're tied to the vine, that then changes your heart. And it becomes less of a behavior modification, but rather a transformation of God in you. Chris said last week, it's not what received is received, not achieved. And so my question for you this morning is, do you know Jesus? Are you simply trying to modify your behavior or do you know Jesus? And if there's a stirring in your heart, and there's something happening inside. Can I encourage you not to push that aside? To explore that. To read and understand and get to know this Jesus of Nazareth. And the change that he can do on your heart. If you know Jesus and you've been struggling for years and years and years. Can I ask how is your, how is your residing and your abiding in Jesus? Are you residing and abiding in him? Secondly is the rhythms and practices. Um, if you, um, in, in, in this world where we have so many moments of indiscretion when it comes to Christian leaders, it seems almost weekly that we have some news that comes forth where some leader, some pastor has had a moral failing of some sorts. There's one beacon of hope in terms of our recent history that I think we can all just breathe a sigh of relief, and that was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham had uh, what was called the Billy Graham Rule. It was called the Modesto Manifesto. And the Modesto Manifesto said this, uh, I commit to not being in the same room as another woman by myself, whether it's a bedroom, a hotel room, a conference room, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's an elevator, he put up clear boundaries to protect himself. It's this intentional idea of going, I need to make sure I know my weaknesses and I need to make an active choice. And some of us in this room are going, you know, that, dude, that was like 20 years ago. I get that. But what boundaries are we putting in our place to actually protect ourselves? You see, when you go by your feelings, you rarely have self-control. Self-control comes from the mind not necessarily in the emotions. And we all know that. And I'll tell you why. Because every morning, I, like most of you, have an alarm clock. And this alarm clock is set for 5.30. And so when I set this alarm for 5.30, I know I need to get up. And I need certain things to do. I need to go get up, go for a run, brush my teeth, have a shower, do my morning Devo, get my meeting order, get to, the, get to my first meeting by whatever time. I know there's a reason why I hit it. I'm, I'm getting up at 5.30. Here's the problem. If I go to bed you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning, here's an inevitable what's going to happen, right? 
the alarm's gonna go off at 5.30, and all of a sudden we're gonna have the satanic snooze button, right? And I call it that because now all of a sudden your life in the, is in these nine minute intervals. And the question isn't how soon can I get up, the question is how many intervals am I gonna hit before I do get up? You see, at that moment, you know you have to get up at 5.30, but what have you done? You've undermined what you know to be true with how you feel. There's three governing structures in, your, in our day-to-day decision-making process. Three things that govern decision-making. First, it's your brain. Secondly, it's in your heart. And thirdly, it's your body. And when done in the right order, when you know what you have to do and you follow through, when they're done in that order, that will tend to yield good results. But when I follow my gut or follow my feelings, that's when I get into trouble. Right? Procrastination is a great example. For those of you in university or in schooling at all or have you know, due dates, procrastination is a great example. Why? Because you know you have to get it done, but here's the problem. I just don't feel like it. I just don't feel, I just want to watch a movie. I'll deal with it tomorrow and, and I will forego um, you know, long-term pain for short-term gain. Right? All of us struggle with this idea and it's usually because we don't have the ability to make, we make a decision and we don't follow through with it. And so as we look, how many times have we been a victim to knowing what to do, but doing something different because it didn't feel right or we didn't have it in us? Self-control is defined as the practice of restraint over your emotions, impulses, actions, and desires. It's the ability to make positive choices and to think before acting. Having self-control and self-discipline is what separates you from the rest of the animal kingdom. I think Irina Uguay has a great point in this. I think her explanation of what's going on here I think is, is so succinct. It is restraint over the emotions and impulses and desires and the ability to make positive choices. My question is, is, is of the regrets we talked about when we first started talking, how many of those times, and I'd reckon most of those times, if not all of them, are regrets when we knew we should have done something but did something different? I shouldn't have eaten that chocolate bar, but I just wanted to. I shouldn't have slept in that bed last night, but it felt so good. Lastly is community. Church, we, we need each other. We do life together. We're not meant to do it on our own. I've, I've heard so many people say, I do, I do church in the woods when I'm hunting. And, and just for you those who know, I, I enjoy hunting. I enjoy being in the woods. But my friends, that isn't church. That is not what church is meant to be. Church is the community of believers helping, supporting, and encouraging. We are meant and designed and structured to be in community, not exclusively of it. And in a hyper-individualistic society where we say, I can do what I want, leave me alone, here's the flip side. The shallow side or the flip side is that I can do it on my own, leave me alone. And you are on your own. You see, When it comes to dealing with patterns and behaviors and rhythms and practices, right, the rhythms and practices of of fasting or the rhythms and practices of of tithing or Sabbath, of sitting in, in moments of time in prayer, sitting with Jesus, these things are hard. And we need each other to spur one another on. Neuroscience tells us that our brain is a physical being. Uh, we, we have a physical, uh, our thoughts and emotions are physically there. And so there's neural pathways. There's so much research on this. Uh, Dr. Leaf is a great resource for those. Caroline Leaf uh, talks at length about this. Right, but we have these neural path. that's a brain by the way, I sort of brain thing. But anyway, it's called a brain. So these are the neural pathways in your head. Now let's, let's call one of these neural pathways, this is the, the habit of eating sugar. I'm just arbitrarily grabbing one, right? Now let's say that you want to change that pathway. You want to you stop this uh, habitual act of always grabbing sugar at 8 o'clock at night. I'm just using something arbitrary. 
If you want to change that, you can. You can actually change the direction of that neural pathway and create a new one. But here's the problem. It takes an inordinate amount of willpower to do it, and it takes 21 days to create a new habit. So for 21 days, you have to have an inordinate amount of willpower to create this new pathway and to dig a trench and to reinforce that pathway over a long period of time, at least 21 days. Some would argue it's actually 36. It's the willpower that's the problem. You see, we all have a willpower bucket called willpower bucket, right? And this willpower bucket is a finite resource that we have. So every time that you not eat sugar because you've committed not eating sugar, that withdraws your willpower. Or you're not going to look, or and you're not going to look online at that porn site. That's willpower. Or you're really, really tired. That reduces your willpower. Right? Over time, your willpower decreases. So as you're trying to create a new pathway, you've got no willpower and you just tank and you can't do it. This is the beauty of where community comes in. Because the community that we live in creates bumper blocks, creates boundaries, creates assistance. And so what happens is they create the bumper blocks that you can create a new pattern and a new rhythm. I go traveling um, for business uh, it used to be more frequent, but uh, about once a, once a month for about a week. And inevitably, when I went for travel, this is what would happen. Uh, I would do fine at home, and then when I'd go traveling, all of a sudden, my rhythms and patterns would be off. Which means I went to bed later, I start eating worse, I start making poor decisions. And I just want to speak, isn't that often what happens and we start making poor decisions? When we're away from the routine and the rhythm and the structure? And so this was the case. And inevitably, I would gain close to anywhere from three to five pounds every time I went, right? So I'd come back, and I'm like, what happened? All of a sudden, five or six pounds heavier, right? And, so, and then I'd, I'd go back to my rhythms, and I'd kind of carve that back out again, go gone for a week, and then I'm up five pounds again. And so what I started to do is I reached out to a friend of mine and, he's, and, and just said, look, can you check up on me? Can you, can you reach out to me throughout the week? And can you just ask how I'm doing? And can you ask me how I'm doing and, and encourage me? And could you also just pray for me? He said, I'd love to. And so what would happen is as I go through the week, I would periodically get a text message and just say, hey, Tim, how you doing? And that was all I needed. You see, what happened was when my willpower was going down because of my rhythms and practices and I was tired and whatever else, I made poor decisions. What happened was he actually bumped it up and he created a framework, framework for me to have accountability. Um, we have what's here called the Genesis Progress, pro Genesis Process. And in that process, it's, a, it's an intensive 20-week process. Um, I've gone through it. Our staff has gone through it. And, and it's not easy because what happens is as, as through this process, God starts to unearth the junk and the, and the garbage in your life. And has he un as he unearths it, as he starts pulling this, thing, pulling this, this garbage out, there's two things that happen. First, there's always an action item in this, in the, at the end of this week. So as you get together, you unearth this thing, uh, unearth it, you talk about it, you kind of explore it, peel back the layers, you know, metaphors, analogies mixed up, but you get what I mean. We're peeling back layers, we're unearthing, we're just, we're, we're kind of bringing it to the forefront. And then in that week, you talk amongst yourself and you, and you figure out what you need to do with it that week. What is the action I need to take? What is the decision that I need to make? How do I use my brain? to change my rhythms and patterns of behavior. That's step one. Here's step two, and this is the beauty of it. What am I going to change? And secondly, who's going to hold me accountable? And so you pair it up with somebody else, and halfway through the week, you call them or they call you, and you go, hey, did you do what you wanted to do? And, and, and I would reckon to say that the success of, of doing that, I think if I remember correctly, I'm going off the top of my head here, but accountability increases your, your, your uh, success rate for a goal, I think by like 150%, if not more. You can double check with me. If, you, if, I, if I got it wrong, feel free to email me. But let's just say it is a significant increase to doing it on your own. You see, creating new patterns and behavior if you need to create patterns of behavior to, to use your brain to, you know, whether it be meditation the word and study the word, or whether it be taking time off in Sabbath, or whether it's, it's, it's doing things rather than not doing things, that takes community. 
But doing those things will only work if you're attached and abiding in the Spirit. They will only work if you're, if you're abiding in Jesus. You see what he couldn't, what you couldn't do, he did do. But it's only by being attached to him. It's only by spending time with him and coming to him and pouring your heart out to him and garnering a relationship and, and being at his feet and studying the word and, and living the word and praying the word and praying to him and talking to him. It's in engaging that that the heart transforms. And when the heart transforms, now you get to, you, 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 you adjunct that to the disciplines and practices and rhythms that you attach to it. And from that, from that, you have accountability in the group from each other. And from that, we have change. My friends, it, it starts, I don't know how else to say it. All I've got is Jesus. That's all I can give you this morning. You know, some of you are, are, are just are feeling the weight of it at the moment, right? You know, and as we're wrapping up this series, and you're looking at all the fruits of the Spirit, including self-control, you're feeling the shame, you're feeling the hurt, you're feeling the pain of just past mistakes that you've made. I, I, I want to close off with this. Um, a friend, friend of mine, I met with him four years ago. I look up to him. He's such a, a wonderful man, loves the Lord. I, I seek advice from him often. Such a beautiful, beautiful man. And uh, he sat down with me four years ago and uh, he said, Tim, I just want to open and share with you that I've actually been struggling with uh, been struggling with pornography for, for a long time. And, and he has redeemed me, he saved me, and it's gone, and I just wanted to share that with you. And after I picked my drop off the floor, because I never saw it coming, and it's not often how it is, right? These things are hidden so no one else can see them. After I picked my drop off the floor, I said, okay, well, what'd you do, right? Like, obviously you did something, what did you do, what worked, because many men struggle with it. And he said, Tim, I didn't do anything. I, I just came to Jesus, and I just said, I need your help. And I sat with him, and I, and I abided in him, and he transformed me, he took it away. You see, that, that might be the story for some. Right, some of us, he, he has the, he, we give him the authority and we give him, or we acknowledge the fact that it's his discretion whether he does that. And he may do that when you come and sit at his feet. But some of us, it may look a little different. And some of us, it's now the start of a journey. It's the start of a heart's transformation of rhythms and practices that put you in a good place and then held together and encouraged by the community when your willpower isn't there anymore. And so as we're, as wherever you may fit in that story, it starts at the source, it starts at Jesus, it starts at his feet. And so this morning, I, if you're feeling that weight, can I encourage you that when there didn't seem to be hope, that there is hope. That the one, that though you couldn't, he did. And so can I encourage you this morning to, to come to the cross and to start with Jesus and allow him to transform your heart so that's not behavior modification, but rather it's transformation of the heart. Lord, we are so, we come before you with our pain. We come before you with our hurt and our past. Lord, there's a, there's a list of fruits of the Spirit that, are, that, is, that is in front of us. And some of these things seem so far away from us. We, we don't know how to, we, we don't know how to get there. And what you tell us is that we get there by being attached to the vine, by getting to know you and who you are. And so for every person this morning, will you meet them where they're at? Would you draw them into you and let them just abide and rest and get to know you? Reveal yourself and soften the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.